the month of mental health awareness and here at faith city central we have a mental health awareness summit that happens every may this year it will be may the 11th and i want you to be a part of it that's whether you're having challenges or not having challenges we just simply give you some principles and some tools to apply to your life so you can live a victorious life every day of your life. I'm so excited to be able to have with me today, Mr. Rick Thomas, who has attended our summits. Absolutely. How has that summit benefited you? Well, I thank you very much for this, Dr. Needy. You know, it's benefited me in so many ways. You know, coming out of the military, I didn't know that I had some of the issues dealing with anxiety and so forth and so on. And coming to the actual, the summit, you know, it gave me some tools on how to deal with or to overcome those things that I was experiencing. And and, and, and so my, my encouragement would be for folk to come on up. As you said, you know, it's not for somebody who may have a challenge. It's for somebody just want to be aware of how to, even maybe to help somebody else with an issue that they may be experiencing. I love so that. So I enjoy it. I Thank love you. it. Thank you so much. And here at our summit, we are always integrating information like from science and the Bible. So you don't have to come and think it's gonna be one-sided. No, our pastor teaches us a sound word on how to have a sound mind. Science just complements what we do here in ministry. So I want you to come be a part of it. May the 11th at 10 a.m. at our Temple Hill campus. See you there. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were, were, not are, were. Awesome. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Because of being in Jesus, we're near to the bosom of the Father. Man, that's awesome. So when you say, I don't have any friends, I don't know who loves me. God does. All right, another verse in that same chapter. Look at this. Look at verse 19. It says that we're talking about who we are. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens, oh my goodness, with the saints. And also we are members of the household of God. Boy, you are somebody and you sitting around here talking about you got low self-esteem. Come up here closer so I can slap you upside your head. See, but we just think all these things that are in the Bible are just window dressing. It's just stuff to fill up. It's something, you got to have something to fill up between the two leather covers. This front cover out here and this one back here. What does all that have to do with my life? Everything everything we've been brought near we're not far off you don't have to go hunting across the world to try to find god you're near but you gotta you have to see yourself that way
trusting God on the way. Woo! Woo! I know that's right. It's a winning Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. I am Pastor Deborah, and I'm here with the word lovers. You got to be a word lover to come out in this rain and press your way into the word of God, right? But we go everywhere else in the rain, don't we? We go wherever we want to go in the rain. But happy Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining us today for Noonday. We're about to dive into this word. So as you're coming on, don't forget to like, don't forget to share because you care, right? Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. I don't know why you haven't subscribed, but if you haven't hit that subscribe button so then you can know whenever our apostle and first lady and the ministry, we are on the air live, always giving you something good from the word of God. Let's see who's online here. I see Miss Stephanie Glenn. Hey, Steph. Maddie Ferguson, Lynn Wilmer. Lynn is always in the place. Salima. Marcella, hey, 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 good to see everybody. Listen, don't forget, share as you are watching. Sometimes you can get so caught up in, you know, enjoying your meal, you forget, <laughs> you know, and share and let someone know we're on. Hi, T, Batista, good to see you. Shanae, all right, all right, I'm excited. I don't know about you, but I am still basking in our Resurrection Sunday celebration. How many of you all were here? It was absolutely, I, can, I ain't even going to say the word Pastor Mike says, super, all of that. It was, it was, it was, we celebrated the resurrection of our Lord and Savior in fine fashion here at Faith City Central. We had our choir to be released, right, to come back. It was absolutely amazing. We took it old school. We threw it back. We had on our church, you know, what is it, attire, dubs, whatever it is. We had it on, right? We were right here praising God, and it was so amazing. And sometimes, you know, when we have such a celebration, it's so easy to let that moment and that impartation go. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking about, Pastor Dwayne called it, he said, Resurrection Sunday for the believer is like the believer's Super Bowl. Yeah. And that thing registered so much in my heart because, and then I went back and started thinking about the Super Bowl. And so I Googled it, right? It said that the 2024, this is the appetizer. Y'all like appetizers before your meal, right? So it said that this year's Super Bowl was the most watched Super Bowl in history. Over 200 million people watched and tuned in to some part of the game. Now, some of them may have been like me and didn't watch the whole thing, but they still recorded over 200 million people tuned in to watch the game. And then I had to go back and see who was playing because I wasn't really that invested. So then it was, I know, I heard I, somebody said, wow. The Kansas City Chiefs, right? became back-to-back -back Super Bowl champs after fe defeating the San Francisco 49ers. Look, 25 to 22 in overtime. So not only did they tune in, but there were people who stayed glued to the television in overtime. How long is the Super Bowl typically? Four hours, three, 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 three and a half, three, 45, something like that. And then after an hour when we're in worship service, the people looking at their watch. <laughs> well, how long is this gonna go? It's time to go, but this is our Super Bowl. And it's not once a year, it's every single time we have an opportunity to gather ourselves around the word. We should be just that excited, right? And so I thought that was so good. And so we got to learn how to sit in a word, saturate yourself with that word. That's why Apostle has given us his notes and now even his slides. So really we are without excuse. There's no reason why we don't go back over the word and sit in that moment. Go back and watch it. It's on YouTube. It's on Facebook. You can be back in Sunday service tonight. Right? You can experience the worship all over again because, listen, everything we do is to make it portable so that you can take it home and reproduce it. 
it's not so we'll just have these exciting moments. Some people live to come into the building. Mm -hmm. But what Apostle is teaching us is that when we experience something in, in the building, he wants us to get understanding, which is divine comprehension in our hearts that give us the ability to repeat that experience at will. So we, we can't have Pastor Tim in our living room, but we can, right? Physically, we can't have him maybe, right? I'm sure he would love to oblige, but he can't oblige all of us. But we can take the expressions of worship and what we learn and what we hear, and we can duplicate it and replicate it and do it over and over and over. So I thought about the cow. I thought about the cow. And I remember Apostle teaching us about how the cow has this stomach. Now, how many people know how many stomachs the cow has? Somebody's holding up four. Well, actually, the cow only has one stomach, but he has four compartments, chambers of that stomach, which allow him to chew and process their food over and over and over again. And the purpose of that is so that he can get all of the nutrients out of that food. Because guess what? I didn't know this until I researched it. When, a, when we see a cow grazing out there in the grass, guess what he's doing? He's swallowing that grass whole. He doesn't even chew it the first time. So it has to go into those different compartments so it can be broken down and properly digested. And some of us come in here and we just swallow it whole and we don't even chew on it. We heard it. And that's the equivalent of just swallowing the word. I was there. I was there. I was at church. I heard it. But did you chew on it? And how long did you chew on it? And because he gave us this word, ruminate, right? And so that cow, he chews on that, that food, that grass, and then it's, it sounds nasty, but he regurgitates it, which just means he brings it back up, right? We have the Holy Spirit who will bring back up the word that we hear so that we can chew on it again and chew on it again. Because I found out when I go back and watch a lesson, every time I watch it, I hear something different. I said, when did he say that? I didn't even hear him say that. What scripture was that? I missed that. I'm looking at my notes, but sometimes you're, when you're really listening for you and not Cheryl should have been here. Man, this is for Cheryl. I wish Cheryl would have been here. That's how you miss what you were supposed to get. And that's why when you go back on the replay and now you're hearing what you were supposed to hear because you was hearing for Mike and Joe because this was for them. That's what I've been telling them. But if you would just really listen for yourself, then you would receive and then go back and listen to it again. It's like that cow with those four compartments and you chew and chew and chew and chew and chew till you get all the nutrients out the word. Was that a good appetizer? Yes. Praise God. All right, so we're going to jump right in here. Um, we've been talking about as he is. I love this lesson. I love this lesson. Apostle made this on a statement on one of his slides. He says, since we have agreed to surrender ourselves, we must be replaced by him. So if you surrender yourself, you must be replaced by him. If not, you're going to show up again. And then he gave us this illustration of a wrestler who refuses to tap out. You know, we all looking at the fight and we saying, dude, just throw in, just throw in the towel. The fight is over. Just let it go. Stop trying to be on top when you're really supposed to be, right? And so we got to know how to tap out and surrender. And so that was a powerful lesson when we went over the TSA. But when we surrender, it positions us to say, now, God, I want to be just like you are in this earth realm. And so we have to understand that we are really, as the church, when I say we, as the church, as the ecclesia, the called out ones, right? We are under the microscopic scrutiny of the world right about now. When I tell you, if you make a post, you got to read your post about five times. Because <laughs> if I say one word that's not politically correct, they're coming for you, right? And it, they will say that you're not operating as God because 
the world has reduced God's image to what they want it to be. And we are making apologies on the behalf of God on the standards of God that God has set. And that's why you've got to be so immersed in this word that it becomes who you are and you become one with the word. So when I give an opinion, it's not my opinion. I'm just agreeing with God, right? And so the Bible says in Matthew 5 and 13, it says we are the salt of the earth, right? And it says if the salt has lost its savor, it's good for nothing. And then it says, we are the light of the world. We are a city. Now that especially applies to us at this address. We are faith city central, right? We are a city set on the hill that cannot be hidden. And so when you think about that, if you're in plain view, now I'm always somewhere, I'm, I'm, when I tell you I am always somewhere where someone will know me that I don't even, you don't even look familiar. And I don't, you know, and, but, but whether they know you personally or not, when you confess to be a believer, people are looking to see if you are going to be who you say you represent. If you got that bumper sticker on your car and you don't want it to light holding your horn for 10 minutes, that's not a good reflection of as he is, so are we, right? And so when, we, when I was, we went to uh, the White House the other day for the ground, on the grounds for the Easter egg roll, it took my granddaughter. And so we're standing there and we had to walk. I mean, we walked and walked and walked and walked only to get to the gate for them to tell us, oh, it's two streets over. And then go down and get in the line. I was like, really? Oh, okay, how wonderful. So we, we went on, we, we pressed on, we got there, we got to the gate, we went into the first part, you know, they did the checks, they did all of that, they got us in, and people in the line, they just fussing and complaining, and I'm thinking to myself, I would love to join in with their conversation. I would so love, because I feel like that too. But I just said, what's the point of complaining? We down here now. We're going to either go in or we're going to stay out. Or we're going to stand in this line and get, get all emotional and get upset and get involved in the conversation that's going to take me down a road that I don't even want to go down and get my blood pressure up. So I had a decision to make, right? So then we go through the first section and it, my, you know, my granddaughter's playing, da, 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 but this isn't even the part of the lawn where the egg roll is done. I said, oh, we got to go somewhere else? So, more walking? So then they take us to another area where we get in another line. So then the escorts say, okay, we all go in the same place. You get on the left, and some of you all get on the right. Everybody's going to the same place. She said, ma'am, you all step over here to the right. I said, yes, ma'am. We go over there, we get to the right, and we walk all the way through the little maze, and we get up to the, almost to the gate. We can see right there, egg roll, kids doing it. We about to get in line. She said, I'm sorry, who brought you all this way? I said, the, the person here, she said, oh, you, you weren't supposed to come this way. You're supposed to go back around and get in that line. I said as he is so am i so we got out we went back around people i can't believe they go oh, they just going 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 and the temptation to join in is just so heightened so we get on around we go back around get in the line we go through that part then we get to another part where we're supposed to be and guess what as soon as we get up to the gate they close the gate They closed the gate. And so it was like two people in front of us and they closed the gate. They said, we're sorry, someone has lost their child. Two, well, actually two people had lost their children. They said, so we can't let anybody in and let anybody out. I said, wow, I thank God the gates of heaven ain't gonna be locked on me like that. Cause there gonna be some people get up to the gate and the gate gonna close right in front of them. So we stood outside the gate, not for five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 45 minutes. So, oh, there are people out there just, oh, they going ballistic now. We right here at the gate and we can't get in. And I'm just standing there, so I'm playing with my granddaughter and I'm we doing stuff and I'm tagging her and she tag. I'm just making up games just to keep myself in the right frame of mind. When all of a sudden, Pastor Deborah, how you doing? I said, man, are oh, we out here waiting? Well, guess what? If I'd have been out there going crazy, acting a fool, 
at the gate, right? Somebody is always watching our witness, whether we know we are always putting God on display in a good way or in a not so good way. And so on Sundays, we have up here on our displays a mirror, right? Let's look at that scripture, James 1, chapter 20, uh, James 1, verse 22. And we're going to look at it from 22 to 24. James 1, 22, 23, and 24. It says, but be doers of the word. <laughs> That means carry out the word that you hear. Not just hears only, doing what? Deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm getting dressed and I'm looking in the mirror, I may look in the mirror, and, but I'm looking at one specific thing. Like at this, this point check, I'm, or checkpoint, I'm looking at my hair. Then, a few, then the next time I come back, I done put my jacket on. Now I'm looking at my jacket. Then by the time I put my shoes on, I may be looking to see if my shoes, my pants touching the top of the shoe, or they're too short or too long, or that shoe doesn't go. But each time you look, in the mirror, you should be looking at something different about yourself. I'm talking about the mirror of the word, yeah. right? You should be making adjustments based upon what you see as your reflection in the mirror. The mirror is designed to show you what you look like. And here's what I found out. If I make corrections about myself, nobody else has to tell me I have my shirt on inside out. But if I look in the mirror and I just gaze at myself and I focus on everything that's right and I don't take time to really examine myself, then people are going to be, when I get home that evening, they're going to say, did you know you had your shirt on backwards all day long? Wow, I wasn't even aware. Because did I really look in the mirror? And so the word is our mirror. And every day we have to make adjustments. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. Because if there's an adjustment, the mirror of the word tells me I need to make so that I can look more like Jesus in my love walk, in my speaking, in my acting, in my responses to people. If it's telling me I need to make some adjustments, but I don't make those adjustments, then guess what? Every time I don't make adjustment, I'm staying right where I was, right? And there should be some graduations in our personal lives. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. Who has it? There it is. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And so we are being transformed into the glory of the Lord. So there should be some graduations. The only graduation, we, shouldn't, we should not just be attending the graduations of those of others, but we should be attending our own graduations. Where we were on last week, we should not still be there on this week. Because as we are looking in the mirror of the word, we should be making some adjustments and those adjustments should be causing graduations, right? There should be a perpetual graduation and matriculation of our lives. But here are four areas that we have to pay attention to. Number one, uh, Apostle gave us this scripture, Matthew 4 and 6, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth, right? The, the King James Version says proceedeth with T-H, but the New King James Version says proceeds continuously, right? That means we can't listen or li read the word one time and think we're going to be transformed into the image of God. 
So the first uh, area of adjustment is in our ingestion, our ingestion. Think about the cow example again, how he swallows that grass without even chewing it. He just swallows it. And until his stomach breaks it down in those four compartments, it does not benefit him. He's just full of it. And so you heard, y'all heard it. I didn't say it. Y'all heard it. I didn't say it. But we can become so full of the word, fat off the word and never digest it, right? So in our ingestion, so by every word, so the intake of the word of God is necessary for us to be as he is. Number two, in our digestion of the word. So first we have to ingest it, right? We have to ingest it. Then we have to digest the word. I thought about Joshua 1 and 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, right? But you shall meditate in it when? Day and night. Day and night. How do you do that? Do you have to go sit in a dark room? Because we say things in, in church, right? We say things, but then what do people who don't really know or familiar with what we're talking about, what do they see when we say that? So when we say meditate, do we, need light, do we mean go light incense and turn the lights off and put a sheet over your head and go hmm? So what, what, does that, what does meditation look like, right? It means to mutter. It means to say repeatedly. It needs to think, it means to think on. It, it means to conceptualize. It means to imagine to see yourself with it, to see yourself doing it, to see yourself becoming it, right? How many times have we heard in this ministry, you must become the word that you hear? So that comes as a result of meditation. And so it says, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate in it day and night, right? Then what, it, then what does it say? So that you might observe, you see it to what? to do it, right? And then you will have good success. So you have to see the word so that you can do the word, okay? And then I'm thinking of 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. It says, I'm still talking about digesting the word. It says, study, study. That means sometimes you got to read that word in the Amplified, in the Message, in the TPT. You're going to have to bring out your commentaries. You're going to have to get out your concordance. You're going to have to ask Siri, Google. You're going to have to really sit down with it and break it down so that you can really hear what God is saying to you. If you have a Bible that you don't understand, you need to get one that you do understand. If you don't understand King James English and thee if it's, thou if it's, do if it's, know if it's, if that doesn't <laughs> minister and speak to you and you're confused and you fall asleep every time you're reading the word, read it in the Amplified. Read it in the New Living Translation. Read it in a translation that will come, make the word come alive to you. I like the way Pastor Dwayne puts himself in the scripture. When he's reading the stories, he said, I was there. That takes meditation. That takes study to see yourself in the scripture, to make it present tense where you are. How would Jesus say that to, to someone if he was saying that in our time? And so you got to make the word come alive. So our digestion of the word is critical and crucial into our becoming as he is. Then in our application, say application. application. Application, and we just read that in James chapter 1 and verse 23. He says, don't just hear the word, right? I heard it. I heard the word. I was there. I heard it. But, that, but that's, that's only half of the equation. He says, don't be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. So now apply the word. What was I doing when I was at the White House? I was applying the word. I wanted to bang on the gate. I wanted to climb on the gate and hang on the gate. 45 minutes. I wanted to hang on the gate with a little child on my back. I want to put it on my back and hang on the gate. But I had to apply the word that I was hearing, and then my patience was able to minister to someone else who saw my life. Right? Then number four, the manifestations of the word. 
So we're talking about the things that we need to focus on so that we can model and become as he is. The manifestations of the word. Let's look at John 14 and 21. John 14 and 21. So firstly, while we're getting John 14 and 21, we said our ingestion of the word, our digestion of the word, our application of the word, and now the manifestations of the word. John 14 and 21 says, he who has my commandments and keeps them. This is somebody who holds the word dear to their heart. He said, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him. And look, and I will manifest myself to him. Where are the manifestations of the love of God in our lives? We should not just be talking the talk. People are tired of the church talking without having manifestations. And when we think about manifestations, we're not just talking about the miraculous healing signs and wonders. We're talking about the, man, the manifestation of a good attitude when you're outside the gate for 45 minutes. We're talking about manifestations of a proper attitude, of kindness, of, of consideration, of opening the door for somebody, holding the door a few seconds longer for somebody walking up behind you, or you're standing in the grocery line and somebody's out of change, or they're, they're short on their bill, and you go in your pocket and you come out with some money to be a blessing to them. We're talking about manifestations Amen. of what we have learned. That's when it's as he is, so are we. Dr. Price asked this question one time. He said, if we are all God has, is God in trouble? Because everybody, a lot of times, most people are counting on somebody else to do what they should be doing wherever they are. An apostle has taught us that wherever we are, we are, that is our field. That is where God has assigned us to represent him. You're not just an employee of whatever company, bank, or establishment you work at, but that is your field, and that is supposed to bring kingdom representation in that place on the behalf of the kingdom of God. So when you're there, God is there. And some people will never come into a physical building. But the Bible says we are God's building. It says it. We are God's building. We are living epistles moving around in the earth that should be putting, on, putting God on display. But if they catch you outside of this building, what are people going to see? So all eyes are on us. And when you live your life knowing that all eyes are on you, it makes you carry yourself. It says he that has this hope in him of Jesus returning, he purifies himself. And every day we should live our life like he could come in the next moment. And I want to be found modeling him, right? Did I read that scripture? Manifest himself to him. Okay. And so the enemy is after our identity. One of the first temptations he used with Jesus was, if you be the son of God, if you be the son of God. Now, the, the dove had just ascended an, an earlier scripture on him saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So it was right after that confirmation that the enemy wanted to question. In other words, he was saying, prove that this is who you are. But Jesus was so immersed in, he was so uh, confirmed and established in who he was, he didn't have to act out of character or go do something against the word of God or the commandment of God, the teachings of God to prove who he was. And so we have to understand that every place that we are in, the enemy is coming after our identity. There's identity theft going on in the church more than it is in the bank and online with our credit cards. So he answered him, he said, it is written. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. 
And so we have to understand that we have to continue in the word. It's not enough to start out in the word. It's not enough to just say the word, but it has to be a continuance in the word that's going to cause the transformation and the renewing of our minds so that we can look just like him, right? John 8 and 31, you can just make a note of it. We don't have to go there, but it says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples? Then. That's the qualification. That's what it, that's what it demands. If you continue in my word, because he knows anytime you keep stopping and pausing and taking a break in the word, from the word, keeping your eyes on the word, meditating on the word, speaking the word, believing the word, there's going to be an interruption. And in the old you that's supposed to be dead and buried somewhere, it's going to show up at the gate. Yes, Keep talking about that gate. Yes, so you have to understand as he is, so are you. You are not your past. You are not your mistakes. That's what the enemy wants you to think. He wants you to think you are the mistake you just made. That's who you are. You are the failure that you keep, keep repeating. You are the unsuccessful business person that because you tried that venture and it didn't work. He wants you to think that that's who you are. You are the label that was put on you by parents who weren't born again. You are the product of infidelity. That's all you are. He wants to tell you and talk you down from who you are in the word of God. That's what he did in Luke chapter 22. The Bible talks about Jesus was talking to Peter. Luke 22 and 31, he said, the Lord says, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Anybody remember the sifters? My grandmother and my aunts used to cook with the sifters when they would bake cakes and they would put the flour in the sifter and they have a little bowl over there under the sifter and they'd be just shaking it and shaking it. And I'm like, what is, what's happening? And they said, well, we want to break the flour down so that it's not so thick that it'll mess, you know, the recipe of the cake up. And that's what it does. And, and it's a process. Sifting is a process. So little by little, our absenteeism from the word of God, Satan is putting you in a sifter. Because guess what? He can't handle you full strength. He's afraid of you at your full potency, walking in complete revelation knowledge that I'm like God that I'm God's address, that I'm Jesus' replacement, that I'm this world's answer. So what he wants to do is break you down like a sifter. He wants to reduce who you are, not just the people, because we're always so concerned about what people say, but he wants to reduce you to you. He wants to reduce you in the eyes of you. Because as you believe in your heart, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So it doesn't matter if everyone, how many famous celebrities have we seen? Beautiful, gorgeous, attractive, but have the lowest self-esteem. In relationship, have been married eight, nine, ten times. And the common denominator in every relationship they've been in is them. And then you talk to them and they don't see themselves as beautiful. So it doesn't matter how much fan mail they get. It doesn't matter that they have 700,000 followers. They are not happy within themselves because Satan or someone has reduced them in their own eyes. And if we don't get our identity straight, if we don't really meditate in this word to see ourselves the way God see us, we will think we are how we feel. Some people didn't feel like coming out today because it was raining. I was, some, we were, cel we're celebrating Pastor Rick Wooten's birthday today. Will you all see him today or think of him, send him a text, tell him happy birthday. But I sent him a text this morning, said happy birthday, big brother. I said, it's raining blessings for you. 
It's all in our perception and perspective, how we see things. Some people stand up and look out the window and say, oh, it's going to be a drill, drill, messed up day to day. Says who? But guess who gets to say that? Says you. And you will have what you say, not what they say. But the enemy has us so concerned with what they say. What they say? Who, what they say? What they say? No, no, no. It's what you say. And not just what you say about others, but what you say about yourself to you. Right? You have to be very careful about the conversations that you have with yourself. Apostle always says people ask, is it all right to talk to yourself? It depends on what you're saying to yourself. If you're telling yourself as you are, you're looking in the mirror as you are, as he is, so, are, so am I. If that's what you're saying to yourself, keep talking to yourself. But if you're telling yourself, oh man, I just can't get it right. If it ain't one thing, it's another. That's where you're going to sit and you're going to remain stuck. So he told him, he said, he said, Satan has desired Peter to sift you as wheat. He said, but I have prayed for you. He said that your faith should not fail. He said, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. When I read that, you know what I thought about? I thought about Apostle on Sunday showing the video again of his, the, the challenge that he went through. And I said, now somebody's sitting here saying, why is he showing that again? Because the Bible says when you come through a challenge victoriously, he said, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So with every time he shows that testimony, he is strengthening the brethren who are being tempted to go through a challenge, going through a challenge, maybe not on that degree, but whatever the challenge is, if you can see somebody has come out of it victoriously, you go back now because he could just have the victory and have the victory and keep it to himself. He's alive and well. But when you turn around and share the victory that he said, no, he said, I, and, and I love the way he showed it in the, in the, in the, concept, the, the sequence of we were showing about how Jesus got up. But then he went on to say the same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead lives on the inside of me. He says, so I allow the resurrection power of the word to raise me up out of my bed of affliction. So now we have a modern day example. And I can't tell you how many people I have ministered to that are in situations that have gotten evil reports, stage four and stage five and stage six. And I say, what stage was Lazarus? Sat Lazarus was in the grave for four days, right? What stage was that? By now he stinketh. He's decomposing. They didn't even have embalming fluid, right? So what stage was that? So why, why do we give up so easily based upon the information of the world and not the revelation of the word? As he is, so am I. But it's all about how we see ourselves. So the impartations that we receive from TSA, agape and honor, brings us to this point of as he is. All of this has come to minister to us in our, not just our current state, but for the rest of our lives. And Apostle said he has requested that we give ourselves to him. And then in parentheses, he says the word specifically in this season for specifically harvesting in the next season. So what the word is designed to do is correct our impaired vision. Because we can look at things as they are or we can see it through the eyes of the word. The word adjusts your vision and allows you to be able to see things correctly through the eyes of God. There were some people in Numbers chapter 13 and verse 33, they had what I call the grasshopper mentality, right? 
the Lord spoke to Moses and he said, send out the spies to go into the land and bring back a report what the land looks like. And so all of, a lot of them came back with negative reports, right? But Caleb said, oh, he said he still, he quieted the people. He said, come on, let's go up at once. Let's stop all this talking. Because y'all going to get a trip in, in about 200 years. Let's go up at once and possess it. Why? Because we are well able to possess it. They were like, what you looking at, Caleb? Because the TV screen I'm looking at, there are giants in the land. He said, and they're bigger than us. He said, and we are grasshoppers in their sight, and that's how we look to us. So he said, why, why do you see yourselves that way? And how do you, and the way you see yourself is the way you think and you project that others see you. That's why he's telling us we have to allow the word to correct our vision. Because if not, we're going to see ourselves so much smaller. And then when you see yourself smaller, you're going to live small. You're going to count yourself out in situations before you even get started. Because whenever God gives you a vision or something to do, it's always bigger than you. As a matter of fact, that can be an indication when something isn't from God. Because you can do it all by yourself. Just like people think they're going to get themselves together without God. I don't, want, I don't want to come to God now. I want to get myself together first. I don't want to be phony. <laughs> Sweetheart, if it was that easy, we wouldn't have needed a Savior. The Savior came to save us from ourselves, right? So how you see yourself, you have to even know how you see yourself will even affect how you pray. Y'all know I got to throw prayer in here somewhere. How you pray. Hebrews chapter 4 and 16, it says, let us come boldly. The only way you're going to come boldly to something or a situation is because of something you know. My kids go boldly into our refrigerator. <laughs> they go boldly into my laundry detergent. They go boldly into my downy softener fragrance beads. They go boldly into whatever I have. They go boldly into my perfume. I'm complimenting the fragrance and find out you got all what I... Because of, because of relationship, because of revelation, because of understanding, because of what they know. And when you aren't confident in who you are and whose you are, we can t your language will always locate you right and I think you know growing up um, in, in church growing up I think a lot of times we thought that sounded humble it was it was a mark of humility to not speak well of yourself to not think well of yourself to not talk and speak the language of faith you you were pride prideful and arrogant so we dummied ourselves down and and, and minimize who the God uh, of our salvation was. I remember years ago, I wonder what Apostle remember this story. We were going uh, to a, a conference, a meeting at, at National, at, at a church, and uh, we were going one night, and he was, him and Dr. D were always grabbing me, come on, we're going to service, Some, somebody was ministering. And so I remember us getting out the car, and we're walking up and some other ladies were walking in. We were going into the meeting and they were like, how you doing, everybody? You know, everybody, bless, bless, you know, bless. Whatever. And um, the lady said, I'm going to get my blessing. I'm going to here to get my blessing. And Apostle said, oh, I'm not going to get mine. I brought mine with me. <laughs> and I was like, ooh, that was rude. <laughs> he had to say it like that because I was new. In the, in the, you know, in understanding faith, and faith has a sound, right? And that was, I mean, I had to be like 16. I mean, not that long ago, but, you know, shouldn't be that funny. It shouldn't be that funny. But he was speaking like that that long ago. He said, oh, no, I'm not going in here to get the blessing. I'm coming in blessed. I've been blessed. And I'm coming in with the blessing. 
And if we all would have a revelation that we come in and bring the blessing, we wouldn't just come in, in, in a worship service or in the ministry for what we can receive. We come in with what we're bringing. Where can I serve so I can release what God has blessed me with to add and complement the vision of the house? Right? Where do I fit? Where can I give my supply? Because I'm so blessed. Yeah. I want to use my giftings and my calling and my talent and my resources and my skill set to be a blessing to impact and empower others. So how you see yourself will affect you even as you pray. Hebrews 4 and 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace so that we may obtain mercy he said, even come boldly when you need mercy. Most of the time when you need mercy, the enemy tells you, come, come ashamed, come all uh, ashamed because you need mercy. He said, no, even because you are as I am, you are my child, even when you need mercy, come boldly to me. He said, and find the grace that you need to help you in a time of need. So there's an exchange that takes place when we come boldly to God, knowing who we are. Not I'm God, here I am, some old pitiful wretch undone who doesn't deserve to be in your presence in any way you see fit God. No, he's like, who is that? If he had an actual telephone, he'd be like, hang up on them. <laughs> That's not the language of faith. The Bible says he watches over his word to bring it to pass. So it'll affect you even as you pray. 1 John 5 and 14 says, come on, and this is the confidence. You're not going to have confidence if you don't see yourself as he is. You're not going to have any confidence. This is the confidence that we have. He didn't say have it in you. He said that we have in him. So when the devil starts talking to you about you, say, yeah, you're right. But my righteousness is not of me. I stand in his righteousness. You can talk about me all day and all night. But when I stand before God, he sees himself. Glory to God. The confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if, and I like to say since, we know he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know, we know that we have. See, this right here, you got to meditate on that. This is not something you just read one time. Man, this got to, you got to sit there and read over it in word and, and break it down and, and say it over and over and over again. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. We, when we are as he, when, as he is, so are we. Jesus prayed this way. Jesus prayed this way. He said in John eleven forty two. 42, make a note of this. He said, Father, I thank you. He was at the tomb of Lazarus. Most of us would have been out there for 10, we'd still be out there right now. Please, Lord. Dear, please, 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 please. We just sound like James Brown. It's so funny when you say stuff like that. People, they say, who? <laughs> he said, Father, I thank you that you always hear me. But for the people standing around, I said it so that they would believe that you are the one that sent me. That don't sound like anybody who don't know who they are. That sounds like someone who has a relationship who is not having an identity crisis. That sounds like someone who knows that they are the son of God. And that's what he wants us to know. He, somebody said, no, not James Brown. <laughs> right, I know. 
He didn't beg. Yes, Noni said he came with expectation and authority. That's, see, if you understand the whole scheme and the whole strategy. See, Satan is very predictable. He doesn't have anything new. The same temptation he did in the beginning in Genesis, did God say? It's the same thing he done brushed off, shined up, polished, put it in a different suit, and, is, and represented it again to you. Did God say? He said that about you. You know you. You know how you are. He's telling you, you can speak the mountains. He's telling you, you can forgive them for what they did. Agape, agape, aunt, really? You, you know your temper. He's talking to you about your weaknesses. But when we understand that as he is, so are we, we understand in our weaknesses. He said, my strength is made perfect in your weaknesses, and then your weaknesses become a platform to show the magnificent power of God. And so, the world has a certain view of the church. And we have to understand it's our job to be those living epistles. It's our job to be those letters. It's our job to walk around confidently representing the kingdom of God. And when you live your life knowing that all eyes are on you, it's not intimidating. You know, when you think about celebrities and they, they're all, you know, a lot of times they say they just can't stand the paparazzi, you know, but they like the million, billion dollar homes and, and Maseratis and all the things that they're driving, but they don't like the attention because they know that they are always not, they are not always who they are portrayed to be in the movie or on the show. Their character may be so different. And a lot of times when, when different uh, uh, television hosts interview actors and, you, and they interview them, their personality is, is completely opposite for who we know them to portray in the sitcom or in the movie. That's not who they are but they act so well. Some of them receive death threats because of the person they play on the show. Because they play the role so well, you think that's who they are off camera, they're getting a check. And so we have to understand the world is looking at us like they're looking at each other to see if we're playing a role. Are they really walking in the authority and the power that they pro profess? Do they really believe if they lay hands on the sick? So if someone comes in with a cold, do we condescend and say, yeah, me too. I tell you what, I have had this flu for four months and I can't seem to get rid of it. You think it's the shot? And we just get in the conversation and we just, bring, we just bring it on down instead of saying, man, by his stripes. I was challenged with that. I was challenged with the flu, but I spoke, I did the natural things that I was supposed to do, but also I applied this word. I ingested the word. I di digested the word. I applied the word. And guess what? I manifested the word. And when you manifest the word, there's going to be a demonstration of the power of God. That's when God puts his super on your natural and then you have a supernatural outcome because you have gotten outside of what you know and what you are and what you can produce and you've tapped into the supernatural realm and you allow Holy Spirit to lead and guide you right into victory out of that situation. Glory to God. And so the Bible says that in Luke 6 and 40, that the student is not superior to his teacher, but everyone that's been perfectly trained will be like his teacher. And we come in here to get lessons, not so that we can just get fat off or full of the word or just take in the word, but so that we can become teachers. So that everywhere we go, we're allowing our light to so shine. I mean, high beam. Have you ever been driving and somebody behind you got on their high beams? Their high beams are not just helping them, but they're blinding you. 
and you can't even see and you got to kind of get out of the way because the high beams just it just illuminates everything in its way right and God needs us in this hour in this season that we in this world is getting so dark I mean everything goes everything is accepted everything is permitted and when you speak against it then something's wrong with you you're not in love. You're not acting like God. As if God is supposed to conform to the image of the world. But God has called us to be those transformational machines. Y'all remember that lesson? See, we can't be forgetful hearers because what the Lord is doing is strategically aligning each lesson to the next lesson, to the next lesson, because he is strategically positioning us. It's almost like a chiropractic adjustment. Mm -hmm. Each lesson, you ever been, anybody ever been to a chiropractor and they make that snap, they snap something, mm -hmm. but you can't just get that one snap and don't go back because <laughs> they're putting things in alignment. And that one adjustment, if you, because I did that one time, I went and I was going and, I, I, and my doctor was out of town and they sent me to a different chiropractor and this young man, he made an adjustment and I never went back. And I kept having all these different pains and aches and tightness and things. And someone said, you didn't finish the adjustment. Mm -hmm. He snapped something out of alignment and now you gotta go back for the next adjustment. Mm -hmm. And so each lesson is, is making an adjustment in our soul. And we gotta put them all together so that we can have that divine alignment so that we can boldly say in the day of judgment, as he is, so are we. Glory to God. Were you blessed today? Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Glory to God. Transformation exposes you to a new world. Hallelujah. Someone said, we can't get that one snap and not go back. <laughs> we have to keep getting aligned with the word. I love that. I love that when you're typing in the chat and you're helping us minister, that's what we're supposed to do. When you hear an impactful statement or scripture, man, shout it out, type it in, put it on there so that if someone was grabbing on one nugget, it's in that first uh, compartment of the stomach, you were in the second compartment of the stomach and you heard something else and you put it up there, and I'm telling you, you will, oh, we won't miss a beat. Praise God. Someone said exposure is the pathway to my increase. Amen. Glory to God. That's awesome. Well, I, I'm excited about the word. Uh, if, you are, if you're here and you want to sow into this word, which everyone should, um, because good ground is so easily identified. You know, someone asked one time, how do you know uh, what good ground is? Good ground is easily identified. Good ground is the ground that's producing what you want, right? Good ground is the ground, the soil. If you see some old, if you go to a garden and you see all the, 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 uh, the leaves all wilted up and brown and the corn is brown and the tomatoes are, are, are yellow and, and just everything doesn't look right, you're not gonna wanna just go plant some more seeds in that ground. But when you go to the one where all everything is lively and the, the fruit has the right color and the greens are, are the proper color and all of that, you're going to say, that's good ground. Look at what it's producing. You can look around here and see what it is we are producing. We're changing lives. And so take this opportunity. There are ways to give on the screen. So into the word. Graduate in your giving. If you typically give $10, go ahead and push the envelope and give 12 Glory be to God. Move the needle and, and increase yourself in that area. And then if you're, if you're watching online or even if you're here and you don't have a pastor, we want to offer our pastor. If you're not born again, listen, you can text FCC Connect to 51555 to be saved, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Listen, every believer needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's like working on a job and denying the benefits. I like working here, but I really don't want any benefits. I don't want dental. I don't want health. I don't want anything. Why would you refuse the benefits to go with the job? The Holy Spirit is the benefit package to the believer. Yeah, you can be saved and, and, and never receive all of the gifts, but why? Why when, it can, when he can make your life so much better? 
and every person needs a pastor. And we have two treats in one. We have an apostle who is also our pastor, and we're so blessed. And so if that's you, text FCC Connect to 51555 to receive our pastor. He would love to be your shepherd, watch over your soul, feed you with knowledge and understanding. And I'm telling you, you plug into this word, ingest it, digest it, apply it. It's going to manifest in your life and you will not recognize yourself after you start doing this word. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. So thank you so much for tuning in with us on today. Uh, we've been blessed by the word of God, but hey, it doesn't stop here. We'll be back this evening at 7 p.m. with the one and only our assistant pastor, Pastor Dwayne Freeman, amen? So make sure you join us. We love you, thank you for watching. What's our scripture? According to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Come on, let's say it together. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Come on, Bishop Freeman, no doubt about it. We love you, see you this evening.